So today we are delighted to be joined by Dr. Nancy Chen. Nancy is an Associate Professor and Evolutionary Biologist at the University of Rochester in New York State. Nancy obtained her PhD from Cornell University, studying the genomic and fitness consequences of population decline in the Florida scrub jay. She then held a number of postdoctoral research positions at the Cornell Lab of Ornithology and UC Davis before taking up her current position at Rochester. Nancy's fascinating research centers around understanding the evolutionary processes shaping patterns of genetic variation over contemporary timescales. Combining genomics and long-term demographic studies with pedigree data, Nancy's work has led to really important insights into short-term evolutionary changes and alle in allele frequencies in natural populations. So today, Nancy will talk to us about some of her current work on autosome Z-dynamics and selection component analysis. So Nancy, thank you so much for accepting our invitation to speak today, and it's over to you. All right, thank you so much, Emily, for that kind introduction and to all the organizers of the seminar series for the opportunity to share some of um, the ongoing work in our lab with you all today. Um, give me a second to share my screen. I also wanna apologize in advance if, um, there are any disruptions from my puppy who gets overexcited if anyone knocks at the door. All right, so uh, before I begin, I just wanted to take a moment to acknowledge that I'm currently speaking to you from the ancestral lands of the Onondo Waga or Seneca Nation of the Haudenosaunee Confederacy. So today I thought I would share kind of two large projects um, ongoing in the lab on looking at short-term evolution in a pedigree wild population of Florida scrub jays. So as you all probably know, um, evolution can occur in just a few generations. There are now many beautiful examples of rapid phenotypic change in nature. And here I'm showing you kind of two textbook examples, um, the evolution of melanism in peppered moths and the evolution of peak size and shape in Darwin's finches. We also know that rapid phenotypic evolution can be can occur in response to anthropogenic changes, such as hunting induced evolution of decreased body size in bighorn sheep. In some cases, we know something about the genes underlying the rapid phenotypic change that we can observe in natural populations. But for the most part, uh, we still lack a really deep understanding of how short term evolutionary change occurs at the level of the genome. Understanding the genomic basis of short-term evolutionary change is essential for assessing the adaptive potential of natural populations and for predicting evolutionary trajectories. Also, uh, the most, I'd like to remind you all that the most basic definition of evolution is, in fact, the change in allele frequencies in the population over time. So in this cartoon example, um, we can see that allele frequencies are changing over time in this one circle population. There are a number of different processes that can change allele frequencies. So mutation can generate new variation, gene flow in and out of the population can increase or decrease levels of genetic variation. Drift typically acts to remove genetic variation in a population over time, and selection can either increase or decrease levels of genetic variation. Understanding these evolutionary processes that govern allele frequency change has been the central focus of the field of population genetics. For most uh, population genetic studies, we go out to our population of interest, genotype a sample of individuals, look at the patterns of genetic variation, and then use computational methods to make inferences about the evolutionary processes that generated the patterns we observe. If we're lucky, we may have multiple temporal samples from the same population, which gives us a little bit more power to make inferences about the allele frequency change. But if you think about what's really happening in natural populations, uh, what's going on is that there are different individuals moving around the landscape. Some individuals die, some individuals survive, and some individuals reproduce. Allele frequencies change over time because different individuals in a population have different genetic contributions over time. These individual level processes are encapsulated in what's called the population pedigree, 
or the set of relationships among all individuals in the population over time. For every natural population, there is one true underlying pedigree and knowledge of this pedigree allows us to directly observe the evolutionary processes that change allele frequencies in real time. The availability of population pedigree data is increasing thanks to heightened awareness of the value of these longitudinal data sets, um, development of tools to accurately construct pedigrees from genetic data, and also as a natural consequence of just the ever increasing sample sizes of population genetic studies. Right now, the most complete population pedigrees come from a handful of long-term individual-based studies that have accumulated complete life histories for hundreds, if not thousands, of individuals um, across decades. And while we've gained substantial insights in many fields from these studies, adding genomics enables us to tackle a whole new layer of evolutionary questions. So my lab um, develops genomic resources and computational tools to combine evolutionary genomics and pedigree data from multi-decadal demographic studies in order to address fundamental questions about short-term evolution in natural populations. So our broad goals are to characterize the evolutionary processes that shape genetic variation over space and time, and to link genetic variation to variation in individual phenotypes, fitness, and eventually population dynamics. Most of the work um, in the lab right now uses the Florida scrub jay, um, this beautiful blue bird shown here. The Florida scrub jay is a cooperative breeder, which means offspring delay dispersal and stay home to help their parents raise future offspring. They are restricted to a really unique xeric oak scrub habitat that has largely disappeared due to human mediated habitat destruction and fire suppression. So the Florida scrub jay is federally threatened and some of our work has conservation implications, although I won't be talking about any of those projects today. There are a few aspects about the biology that make this species particularly amenable to long-term studies. Florida scrub jays are non-migratory and hylophilopatric, which allows us to follow the same individuals over time and also their descendants. They're socially and mostly genetically monogamous, uh, which means we can construct accurate pedigrees from field observations alone. For the field biologists out there, you'll also appreciate that scrub jays are really easy to work with um, in the field because they are addicted to peanuts. Uh, I will clarify that this is not standard field protocol and we typically try to interact with these birds as little as possible. So a population of Florida scrub jays has been really closely monitored at Archibald Biological Station since 1969. And there's been an extensive amount of field work that goes into this study. The entire population is census once a month um, which means we have accurate information on individual lifespans. Every nest of every family group is found and closely monitored. So we know how many eggs are laid in each nest, how many of those eggs hatch, and how long um, the nestlings live. In other words, we have the ability to accurately measure annual and lifetime reproductive success for nearly all the individuals in our population over time. We also have direct measures of dispersal distances um, for many individuals. And importantly for my work, starting in 1999, blood samples have been taken from every nestling and immigrant recruited into our population, which means we have this huge archive of DNA samples for everyone in our population going back for decades. Uh, all territories are mapped each year, and we also have data on habitat composition, food availability, uh, climate, fire history, et cetera. So over the past half century, um, we've accumulated complete life history and phenotypic data for more than 10,000 individuals on a 14 generation pedigree. I'm showing our population pedigree here on the right as a complicated mass of sticks and symbols. Um, and finally, we also have fairly comprehensive genotyping of our population over time. So we uh, have substantial genomic resources for the Florida scrub jay now. Uh, we have a high quality genome assembly. 
And as a graduate student, I designed um, custom alumina isolate bead chips to genotype about 3,800 individuals at 12,000 SNPs across the genome. The figure on the bottom here shows the total number of birds in our population over time in gray and the number who are genotyped in blue. As you can see, we've genotyped nearly every individual in our population for more than the past decade. And this wealth of genomic, environmental, demographic, and phenotypic data from a population with known genealogy provides a really powerful framework for directly testing core predictions of evolutionary biology and nature. Today, I thought I would uh, talk about kind of two stories and provide an overview of the process that we've, um, the progress we've made in looking at how sex bias demography and inheritance impact evolution on short time scales, as well as a more fine scale dis dissection of selection on different stages of the life cycle. So the first project was led by uh, Felix and Rose and the um, second project was done in collaboration with Alyssa and Candy. In sexually reproducing organisms, different sexes often have different life history traits. So for example, males and females can have different dispersal likelihoods and distances, different survival probabilities, and different numbers of offspring. These differences in life histories between sexes can play a really important role in shaping patterns of allele frequency change across the genome. Uh, in particular, sex bias demography disproportionately influences patterns of genetic variation on sex chromosomes, which have different inheritance patterns between the sexes. So in organisms which have XY sex chromosomes, such as most mammals, females are XX and males are XY, Females transmit one copy of their X chromosome to all their offspring, whereas males transmit their X to their daughters and their Y chromosome to their sons. Based on these different numbers of chromosomes in males and females, uh, we expect autosomes and sex chromosomes to have different affected population sizes and therefore different levels of genetic diversity. In fact, many previous studies have used diversity ratios of sex chromosomes and autosomes to infer sex bias demographic processes over long time scales. Here, we explore how sex bias demography and inheritance influence short term evolutionary dynamics in a natural population. So instead of using patterns of genetic variation to try to infer the evolutionary processes that generated them, we use extensive population pedigree data to demonstrate how sex bias demography shapes allele frequency change on autosomes and sex chromosomes over a small number of generations. So the first step that we took was to look at variation in fitness in our population. From our pedigree, we know that there's fairly high variation in lifetime reproductive success. Here, uh, here I'm defining lifetime reproductive success as the total number of nestlings produced over an individual's lifetime. This histogram shows um, lifetime reproductive success for about a thousand dead breeding adults. As you can see, many individuals don't leave any offspring and some produce more than 40 uh, during their lifetime. Since we have a fairly complete population pedigree, we can go beyond this commonly used single generation proxy for fitness and identify all descendants of any given individual in our population over time. To illustrate, here is a male who showed up in our population in 1992. He had four kids, none of his kids reproduced. So this is his, the pedigree of all of his descendants in our population over time. We can contrast this with another male who showed up in our population the same exact year. And as you can see, clearly had much higher fitness. He had 41 offspring, many of his offspring survived to reproduce. And so his pedigree of descendants is uh, dramatically larger. We can quantify this variation in terms of an individual's genealogical contribution um, over time. So here I'm defining genealogical contribution as the proportion of the birth cohort in a given year that's descended from a given individual. So for instance, our first male had kids in 1994 and 1996, and then does not contribute to the population after that. Our more successful male has a substantially higher uh, genealogical contribution 
In fact, about 25% of the birth cohort in 2013 is descended from this one individual. One thing that's important to keep in mind um, is that there's a difference between genealogical contributions and genetic contributions for a particular individual. Not all genealogical descendants actually inherit genetic material from a given ancestor. So in this cartoon pedigree, if we're looking at the contributions of um, the female highlighted in green, all of the individuals uh, represented by empty symbols are genealogical descendants of this particular individual. Each parent contributes half of their genome to the next generation in blocks that are randomly broken up by recombination. And due to the vagaries and randomness of Mendelian transmission, by chance, some of um, our focal individual's descendants will not actually inherit any genetic material from her. So we can use our pedigree to estimate not only an individual's genealogical contributions, which I'm showing here in blue, but also their expected genetic contributions, which I've added onto these plots in black. So remember an individual's genealogical contribution is a proportion of the birth cohort related to that individual. Um, and their expected genetic contribution, on the other hand, uh, refers to the expected proportion of alleles at a locus in the birth cohort that are inherited identical by descent from the focal individual. So if you look at the plot on the top right, you can see that the genealogical contribution of a particular individual is substantially higher than their expected genetic contribution and this just is a nice kind of empirical illustration for a long body, of, substantial body of theory on the relationship between genetic and genealogical ancestry. Now to understand how sex bias demography may affect patterns of genetic variation in our population over time, we first compared the expected genetic contributions of males and females. Um, so to illustrate, here is the pedigree of all descendants for a pair of individuals uh, who never mated with anyone else. So they have the same number of descendants. Um, that also means that they'll have the exact same genealogical contribution to the population over time. Their expected genetic contribution over time for a given autosomal locus will be um, the same for the males and females. And to clarify, sorry, I forgot to say this earlier, the black line indicates the mean expectation and the gray shading is a 95% confidence interval. Uh, the pattern will not be the same for both sexes on the sex chromosomes. So really quick refresher, sex chromosomes have different transmission rules. In birds, females have ZW sex chromosomes and males are ZZ. Females transmit their Z chromosome to their sons and their W chromosome to their daughters whereas males transmit one copy of their Z chromosome to all of their offspring. So given these transmission roles, um, the expected genetic contributions of males and females on the Z chromosome are expected to be different. On the bottom right, I'm plotting the expected genetic contribution for Z locus uh, for males in blue and females in pink. You can see here that males have a higher expected genetic contribution to the population over time, even though they share the exact same number of descendants. We can directly compare the expected genetic contributions of males and females to Z chromosomes and autosomes at a population level. Here uh, in this plot, I'm showing the expected genetic contribution to the population in 2013 for the Z on the Y axis and the autosomes on the X axis for about a thousand dead breeding adults. Females are shown in pink uh, dots and males in blue. Overall, um, the ratio of Z to A expected genetic contributions is one to one. Here, the dashed line shows the theoretical expectation and the solid line shows the estimate from linear models. However, females to males should contribute differently to the Z to autosome ratio. And if we look at the relationship for each sex, we find that our data closely match theoretical expectations. So the ratio of male Z to A uh, expected genetic contributions is four thirds, while the ratio for females is two thirds. 
We can also use this approach to quantify how much incoming immigrants are contributing to levels of genetic variation in the population. Um, I forgot to mention earlier that for the Florida scrub jay, um, there are no significant differences in lifetime reproductive success or survival of males and females. The primary um, sex bias uh, dem demography that we see in our population is sex biased um, dispersal. So there's strong female bias dispersal. And so we know there's really high levels of um, female bias immigration into our study population. And from previous work, we know that immigration is really critical for maintaining levels of genetic variation. So we wanted to estimate how much male and female immigrants are contributing to our population over time to try to assess the impact of female bias dispersal and to just get a sense of kind of how much genetic variation are these immigrants actually contributing to our population over time. So ignoring sex for now, here is the cumulative expected genetic contribution of all immigrants appearing in our population after 1991 in black. The stacked color lines show the added contribution of each incoming cohort of immigrants. Immigrants arriving since 1990 are expected to contribute about 75% of the alleles present in uh, our 2013 birth cohort, um, which is a lot more than we had initially expected. Here I'm showing the expected genetic contribution of all male immigrants over time in blue and female immigrants in pink. You can see that female immigrants have a higher expected genetic contribution for a given autosomal locus, uh, which makes sense because most of our incoming immigrants are females. However, every incoming male brings in two copies of the Z. Um, so we actually see the opposite pattern for Z-link markers. Thus, in this case, sex bias demography and sex bias transmission interact to produce different impacts of gene flow at different regions of the genome. So I've been focusing a lot on individual genetic contributions because variation in individual genetic contributions over time is what underlies allele frequency change in populations. Now, remember, we do have genomic data for nearly all individuals in our population from 1999 to 2013. And we wanted to uh, use these data to see if we can quantify the relative importance of males and females as well as different evolutionary processes in shaping observed changes in allele frequencies from year to year across the genome. To do so, we constructed a model that took advantage of our exhaustive population monitoring. So if we know the number of individuals in our population at each time point, big N, and their genotypes, we can simply calculate the change in allele frequency P between consecutive years. Um, to help us kind of partition the variance in allele frequency change, we grouped individuals in our populations into six different categories. In any given year, some of the individuals in our population will be females who were present the year before and survived um, to our focal year. Their contribution to the change in allele frequencies on autosomes it's a function of the proportion of individuals in uh, year T who are female survivals and the difference in allele frequencies between the group of female survivals and the entire population in the previous year. Similarly, the contribution of male survivors to the change in allele frequencies is um, a function of the proportion of individuals who are male survivals, male survivors, and the difference in allele frequencies between this group of male survivors and the entire population in the previous year. Other individuals are new incoming female and male immigrants and their contribution to allele frequency change is similar. And finally, the remaining individuals are female and male nestlings born in a given year. So given this model, plus some error terms to account for the individuals we didn't genotype, we can quantify the proportion of allele frequency change across all autosomes due to these three processes and the co covariances between them. We also constructed a very similar model to Z chromosome loci, 
And the goal here was um, if we model males and females, as well as autosomal and Z-link variation separately, maybe we can start to assess the contribution of both sex-biased demography and sex-biased inheritance on short-term frequency change. So first we looked at the relative contributions of survivors, immigrants first, and the covariances between these groups um, to the overall variance in allele frequency change over time. So here I'm showing the proportion of variance in allele frequency change from year to year for autosomes on, in the top panel and the Z chromosome on the bottom panel. Um, the variance due to survivor is shown in orange. Um, Yellow is the births, red is the covariance uh, between these two terms, and the blue colors indicate the proportion of variance due to gene flow or immigration. This proportion varies a little bit from year to year, which is totally normal and what we expect. Overall variation in survival and reproduction explains about 90% of the variance in allele frequency change over time um, for both autosomes and the Z although the relative contribution of births is slightly smaller on the Z chromosome. Uh, this variation in survival and reproduction encompasses both drift and selection. We did do some additional simulations to show that indeed it is uh, drift that is the predominant force driving allele frequency change over time, and that's entirely consistent with our small population size. It's kind of fun to see that our model reflects patterns that we observed in the field. Uh, for instance, 2012 was an especially bad year in our population, and we had the smallest birth cohort observed in decades. And from our model, we actually see that survivors have a disproportionate impact on allele frequency variation in that particular year. We can also assess contributions of each sex to allele frequency change. So again, here I'm showing results for the autosomes in the top panel and the Z chromosome in the bottom panel, but the colors are different here. So purple denotes the variance in allele frequency change caused by covariance between females and males. Pink is the variance due to females and blue is the variance due to males. So females and males contribute equally to autosomal allele frequency change over time, but females contribute a lot less to allele frequency change on the Z. So to quickly sum up this first part of my talk, um, we characterize the effects of sex bias demography, inheritance, and their interplay on short-term evolutionary dynamics. We found similar average expected genetic contributions between the sexes on autosomes, but highly male biased contributions to the Z chromosome. Because of female bias dispersal, we found that female immigrants contribute more to autosomal genetic variation, but because of male biased inheritance of the Z, male immigrants contribute more to Z genetic variation. Genome-wide variance in allele frequency change from year to year is primarily driven by variation in survival and births. Um, and while contributions to allele frequency change at autosomal loci are equally distributed between the sexes, males contribute um, a lot more to allele frequency change at Z length loci um, compared to females. And if you are interested in learning more about this project, uh, there is a preprint up on BioArchive for you now. All right, so uh, everything I talked about so far has been looking at you know, individual genetic contributions and allele frequency changes from year to year. But one thing to keep in mind is that selection is this really complex process and it can act at different stages of the life cycle. Here I'm showing you kind of a typical life cycle diagram for a sexually reproducing uh, organism. And there are many opportunities for selection to act. For instance, um, different individuals uh, with different genotypes may have differential survival from zygotes to adults, um, also called viability selection. Um, not all adults who survive actually have the opportunity to reproduce, so there's a lot of opportunities for sexual selection. Um, there's going to be variation among individuals in terms of um, clutch sizes or total numbers of offspring produced, um, also known as fecundity selection. And then finally, uh, there may be segregation distortion or gametic selection. 
Tim Prout in the 60s was the first to point out that kind of traditional tests of selection that look at changes in um, genotype frequencies from year to year confound these different selection components and that really rigorous um, inference of selection should try to disentangle selection acting at these different life cycle stages. Christensen and Freidberg in the 70s came up with this really elegant hierarchical series of tests to actually disentangle um, selection at these different life cycle stages. Uh, their framework is called selection component analysis. It was originally developed for um, random mother offspring pairs. Um, and, and some folks have kind of developed it a little bit further to in, include um, more data. What we've done is since we, we've taken like the spirit of selection component analysis and adapted it to what our situation um, in which we have complete sampling, sampling of whole families and also a ton of environmental data. So let me walk you through some of our analyses, um, some of our results so far. I'll start with the medic selection. So the hypothesis that we're testing here is whether or not heterozygote individuals transmit both alleles equally frequently. In this kind of cartoon nuclear family, if dad is a heterozygote, does he produce an equal frequency um, of heterozygote and homozygous offspring? To ask this question, we developed a full likelihood approach um, for testing for gametic selection. So what we did was we kind of combed through our data set and identified all of the families where at least one parent was a heterozygote at a given SNP. Um, we then counted up the number of individuals of each genotype produced um, by these parents. And then we can um, use a likelihood approach to estimate the probability the male transmits the big A allele um, and the probability the female transmits the big A allele. Um, and then finally, we can use a likelihood ratio test uh, to ask whether or not this probability, these two probabilities are significantly different um, from 0 0.5, which is our null. And here is the result if we do a joint analysis for males and females together. Um, this is the Manhattan plot. I'll be showing a lot of these. Um, so to quickly orient you, uh, the y-axis is um, the minus log 10 p-values and all of the SNPs are arrayed along the genome um, on the x-axis. So there were three regions of the genome um, that passed multiple testing criteria. One of them we looked at a little bit more and it was the sample sizes were small enough that we didn't quite believe it. Um, so, so far we tentatively have one hit on chromosome two and one hit on chromosome 10. Uh, we can actually plot and look at the probabilities. Um, here's the likelihood surface for probability of male transmission on the y-axis and probability of female transmission on the x-axis. And you can see the, uh, for the chromosome 10 SNP, it looks like males transmit one allele about 60% of the time. And for the chromosome 2 SNP, males transmit one allele like 90% of the time, which seems really high. I will say that we just got whole genome um, resequencing data. So we are following up on these regions to make sure we're not detecting some artifact of like a deletion um, that's segregating in our population. Uh, and also I wanted to mention that this is ongoing work and we are um, still working on annotating these SNPs. So I'm uh, sad that I can't actually tell you any um, fun stories about potential genes that may be located near any of the kind of genomic regions of interest that we identify. For the other three components, viability selection, sexual selection, and fecundity selection, we use the same approach. So I will introduce them together. Here we used a mixed model approach where the um, response variable is either whether or not an individual survived, um, their breeding status, or clutch size. We included the full kinship matrix, natal year, and natal nest as random effects. Um, and then the beauty and curse of a lot of data is that we also had a bunch of kind of potential fixed effects that we needed to consider. So these um, 
potential uh, fixed effects include attributes of the individuals, so their age, their inbreeding coefficient, whether or not they're an immigrant, et cetera. We also have um, a lot of information about the natal territory of an individual. So how many helpers uh, were at the nest? What was the territory size, fire history, parent age and experience? And finally, there's also a lot of environmental variables that vary from year to year that may influence these different fitness components, such as density, rainfall, um, acorn abundance, et cetera. So uh, what we did was we first kind of went through all of these potential uh, environmental variables, removed anything that was highly correlated, um, and then took a subsampling approach to perform variable selection. And then once we uh, had selected variables for each of our models, we then fit um, the SNP genotype for each of our SNPs. So we're essentially doing a genome-wide association study for different fitness components here. We ran models for females and males separately and also both combined. And um, I'll just give you a highlight of some results that we've obtained so far. So far. Let's start with viability selection um, in females. So we banned all of our nestlings when they're 11 days old. Uh, Florida scrub jays leave the nest when they're about 18 days old. Um, and the fledglings kind of hang out and pretend to be pine cones until they're 30 days old. By day 90, um, the juveniles are nutritionally independent from their parents. By day 300, they're physiologically capable of reading. Um, and then the final uh, life stage that we considered is whether or not they actually established to become a breeder. Um, and if they were a breeder, how long did they live? So for females, um, if we look at the time period from day 11 to day 90, so survival to nutritional independence, um, the fixed effects that were important to consider in these models were the individual's hatch date, uh, their hatching order, and also their inbreeding coefficient. And after controlling for these effects, we found one SNP on chromosome 5 that was strongly associated with survival. Um, it was slightly surprising to see that some of our hits had fairly large um, potential effects. So here are kind of survival, the probability of survival for females of the different genotypes. And you can see that the alternate homozygotes have a difference in survival probabilities of like 0.3. Um, so there's a clear uh, genetic component to survival in our population, and we're doing a lot more to investigate. Uh, for males, we also found a potential hit in the same time period. The fixed effects that were important here were slightly different. So hatch date and order still mattered. But here we also needed to consider the number of helpers at the nest and whether or not the parents were immigrants, how many of the parents were immigrants. Um, and we found one potential uh, hit snip on chromosome um, 29. For fecundity selection, um, here we were modeling variation in egg number. Um, in females, the fixed effects we had to consider were whether or not they were new breeder and the nest state. Um, for males, it was important to consider whether or not his mate was a new breeder, the nest state, and also his immigrant status, the drought index of the breeding territory and um, proportion of scrub habitat. We didn't find any um, hits in females, but in males, there were three SNPs that were strongly associated with egg number. So as a quick recap, um, we've done a bunch of analyses on kind of looking for selection on different stages of the life cycle. And so far I showed you some of our results. So we found kind of evidence and for kind of two SNPs under comedic selection in males, three SNPs under fecundity selection in males, and um, oops, I forgot one SNP in females and one SNP in males under viability selection. So one of the ultimate goals of this analysis is to use this really careful dissection to start to understand kind of the role of selection in um, maintaining variation in genetic variation for fitness over time, 
and also to see if we can get a bigger understanding of kind of what underlies variation in lifetime reproductive success. So we did also um, run a genome-wide association study for lifetime reproductive success in males and females separately. And we can look at the correlations of effect sizes for um, suggestive SNPs across the genome. So here we're including SNPs where the raw p-value was less than 0 0.1. Um, and I'm showing you kind of correlations that were uh, slightly significant. So the correlations are filtered for a p-value of 0 0.4. Um, so to orient you a bit on this heat map, red squares indicate positive correlations, blue squares are negative correlations. Um, we blocked out female and male tests and also like our different fitness component tests here. So if you focus on kind of the squares that are in the black rectangles, those are looking at correlations between um, lifetime reproductive success in males and females and the different kind of fecundity, sexual and survival um, selection analyses. And you can see here that you know, the strongest um, correlations are between our different measures of survival. Um, so this was something that we knew kind of already from the field data that lifetime reproductive success is primarily driven by survival. Um, but, but it's nice to also see it um, kind of in our selection component results. We also wanted to see if there was any evidence for sexual conflict. So do we often see kind of a SNPs with effects, opposing effect sizes in males and females? Um, if we look at the squares in the, um, the different squares in the larger highlighted square, uh, you can see that there's some evidence, but fairly limited evidence of um, potential sexual conflict. And then finally, we also wanted to see if there was any evidence of life history trade-offs. Um, so here I'm circling uh, regions of this plot that show kind of your classic life history trade-off between survival and fecundity. And there's some evidence, um, maybe strongest is we see a really strong negative correlation between female breeder lifespan um, and female fecundity. So these analyses are kind of still in their preliminary stages, but I'm really excited about the potential of this work to kind of increase our understanding of, kind of the genetic basis of fitness and mechanisms that are maintaining genetic variation. Okay, so to quickly sum up, um, I talked to you about kind of two big projects uh, that are ongoing in the lab. So one, we characterize the effects of sex bias demography, inheritance, and their interplay on short-term evolutionary dynamics. We found that because of female bias dispersal, female immigrants contribute more to autosomal genetic variation, but because of male bias inheritance of the Z, male immigrants contribute more to Z genetic variation. Genome-wide variance in allele frequency change from year to year is primarily driven by variation in survival and births. And while contributions to allele frequency change at autosomal loci are equally distributed between the sexes, males contribute a lot more to allele frequency change at Z-length loci than female. Um, I also kind of gave you some of the results from this big selection component analysis project where we're trying to dissect kind of selection on different life history stages and then use our results to look for um, kind of contributions to lifetime reproductive success and understand uh, or try to quantify kind of how much sexual conflict or um, life history trade-offs that we can actually see operating at the level of the genome. And taking a quick step back, I hope I've convinced you that using pedigree information and population genetic inference is a really powerful way of modeling contemporary evolution in natural populations. Um, and this ability to kind of estimate individual genetic contributions of future generations and to trace the inheritance of genomes down the pedigree provides this precise estimate of the evolutionary processes governing the low frequency change through time. Right now we're in the process of um, doing whole genome resequencing for all of the individuals on our pedigree, uh, which I'm excited about because then we'll be able to do a lot more fine scale analyses and haplotype based analyses um, moving forward, so stay tuned.
All right, none of the work I do uh, would be possible without the huge, amazing crew of interns and staff who collect field data at Archbold every year. It's a really fun community and I'm really grateful to be a part of it. Uh, I'd also like to thank my wonderful team of collaborators and students. Um, so the work I, again, the work I talked about today was primarily um, driven by Felix, Rose, Alyssa, and Andy. Um, I'd also like to thank the many folks who've provided comments on this work and my funding sources over time. So thank you so much uh, for listening and I'm happy to take questions if there's still time. I guess I should stop sharing. Yeah. <laughs> thank, yeah, thank you so much, Nancy. That was, that was brilliant um, and really interesting. Um, there is still time for questions, so if you have any questions for Nancy, please do put them into the dedicated Slack channel. Um, there's a questions for speakers uh, channel there where you can type them in and then I will read them out. Um, so, yeah, I know there's a bit of a delay on the kind of live um, us talking and, and uh, people receiving, so... Um, while we wait for people to put questions there, um, I will start with one maybe. Um, so, you, oh, you said at the end there that you're you're doing some genome resequencing, which sounds really exciting. Um, so, is that of um, the whole population, sort of lots of individuals, or is that just to get a reference, uh, a resequence reference genome? Or could you could you say a bit more about that? Oh yes, of course. So we do have a good reference. Well, now we have like two reference genomes, one for a male and one for a female. Um, the resequencing we're doing, the goal is to resequence all the individuals in our population from 1999 forward. Um, that's like thousands of individuals. So we're um, hoping to take advantage. Our current strategy is a mix of high and low coverage sequencing, and we're hoping to take advantage of a pedigree to perform genotype imputation. Um, to fill in kind of genotype calls for low coverage individuals. Wow, that sounds like a huge amount of work. <laughs> but, yeah. But it should be really powerful, I guess. <laughs> so we have a couple of questions um, coming in already from the audience. So, um, uh, so Georgie says, great work. Can you trace across generations the frequency dynamics of the SNPs that you identify as associated with fitness? Um, that's a great question. Uh, we, haven't, we, we haven't done this analysis very thoroughly for all of the different SNPs that we found associated, um, but so because the analysis has just been going through so many different variations. Um, but I can say that when we checked in the past, at least on previous iterations of the model, um, we actually didn't observe kind of, there's no overlap between the SNPs that we identified using gene dropping as being significantly um, changing in our population over this 15 year time period and our, uh, the hits for our fitness component analyses. So my guess is that uh, the reason for this is because a lot of our, um, a lot of the SNPs have opposing effect sizes for different life stages for the different selection components. Um, so we wouldn't necessarily expect them all to be increasing rapidly in a very, very short amount of time. Um, but one thing we haven't done is look to see if that association is, um, stronger with like our lifetime reproductive success. Uh, I should also say there's one problem too with this analysis and that we're looking at, we're testing for significant allele frequency changes in the exact same data set that we're using to estimate um, the selection coefficient. So there is a little bit of circularity there. So we have to be able to, like what we can say is somewhat limited. Thank you. Um... Uh, so another question, I guess, uh, more of a kind of technical question about the field work. How, how do you track a bird from its birth until its death? 
Um, so the study site is relatively small. Um, so we can track we can track all individuals who remain on our study site. So um, and that means that we really only have really accurate estimates of juvenile survival. Individuals don't leave their territories um, until they're a year old. So if they disappear, we go out and census every single territory every month. Um, so if some, a, a juvenile disappears, that's most likely a death. Um, breeding, there's very little breeding breeder dispersal. So if an established breeder on a territory dies, that's also, or disappears from censuses. Um, that's also a, most likely a death. Um, for our non-breeders, the helpers, they can either emigrate out of the study site or die. Um, so if they disappear, we can't quite disentangle the two, although we do know that emigration looks great um, based on kind of surveys of peripheral scrub um, is very low. I don't know if that answers the question. Uh, I, hope, I hope it does. Um, yeah, and if not, I'm happy to go on to Slack later to continue the discussion. Sure, that, that's brilliant. Thank you. Um, so we'll just wait to see if anyone has any more questions. Um, otherwise, um, I had a question about, so the, the you showed the, the really nice figures of the individual genetic contributions from the male, the female and male immigrants. Mm -hmm. And um, it looked like in earlier years and even very recently, those those contributions were quite equal between the males and females, if I've understood the figure correctly. So that does that just correlate with sort of how many female if the if the immigrants are female biased, has that changed over time? Or what could be some reasons for that? Uh, so the Female bias, so starting out similar, I think it's just because we're starting, we're both starting at zero. Um, so that I think is just an artifact uh, for the later years. And this is something that we need to follow up on. But my guess is that over time, there is still female bias immigration into our population over time. Um, and, my guess, and currently, um, and my guess is it just took some time for the female contributions on the Z to catch up um, to the male contributions. So we want to extend the analysis by another five to 10 years because it'd be interesting to see um, if it switches, uh, but we haven't done that yet. Sure, yeah, that would be really interesting. Um, and is, is there a reason why the immigration is female biased? Is that sort of typical for, for birds or? Um... Yeah, female bias dispersal is often seen in birds. I think it's male, male bias dispersal seems to be more common in mammals. Um, in the Florida scrub jays, female bias dispersal makes sense given the social system. So males are always socially dominant with females. Um, and that means only male offspring have an opportunity to inherit a territory from their parents. So females tend to leave earlier and farther. Um, and we're looking at to see whether or not kind of this sex bias dispersal um, is an inbreeding avoidance mechanism too. Um, okay. Well, I no one has posted any more questions, but um, I think if, if anyone thinks of any more questions, as Nancy said, um, she's happy to go on the Slack channel and, and have a look there. So um, if you do think of anything, please, please post um, up on the Slack channel. Um, and it's nearly, uh, the hour's nearly up. So I guess, I guess we'll stop there. And um, yeah, just thank you so much, Nancy, again, for, for giving us a really, really interesting presentation. Thank you so much for that. No worries. And so our next talk um, will be in March. And so please keep an eye out on our Twitter page and Slack channel for updates for that. And until then, um, take care. <laughs>